Uh, well, uh, good evening, everybody, and I'd like to thank you for coming along uh, this evening. I assume it's uh, based on your own uh, different interests in roads and highway engineering, and I'd like to welcome anybody who's uh, looking at this online and welcome you, welcome you into the lecture. Uh, my name is Paul McDonald. I'm an engineer with Kildare National Roads Office, and uh, I've been involved in highway design and construction for the, the, the major part of my career. Uh, I came to uh, formulate this uh, talk based on the fact that I work on the NACE bypass upgrade and the M7 Osbertstown interchange scheme. And uh, the M7 uh, from, from Dublin to Cork is one of the 10 T uh, road networks within Europe. So I, I, I saw this reference to the 10 T within the EIS for the M7 NACE bypass upgrade and it stimulated my interest. So I, I decided to do some research and, uh, uh, and it was a fascinating uh, overview of what's been happening within highway engineering in the from from the post-war period up till about uh, 1990. So anyway, um, I think it's important to, to to take a review of the the development and the history of the 10T, uh, Europe's motorways, autobahns, autoroutes, and auto vegans, uh, because um, they were so important for the political and economic development of Europe during the 20th century. Um, and the, the themes that, that I come across in the literature are the same that we all face today. Uh, the the trade-off on route selection uh, of different routes, the advantages and disadvantages of different routes, the importance of public consultation, and also the importance of knowledge sharing on uh, between staff and also between countries in terms of knowledge of uh, road design and road construction. And I think it's important to take a historical point of view as well. Uh, we're going to take an overview of the last 50 years in highway engineering, and it might stimulate us to think about the next 50 years as to where we might be going in terms of roads in the future. Uh, given that they're, they're looking at um, the, um, a whole series of uh, electrical charging stations across the entire European road network, probably, presumably for e-cars, uh, I, I think uh, road still has, a, has an important relevance into the future, although the types of cars we will be driving might be slightly different from our petrol and diesel cars today. So that's, I think that's the importance of uh, taking a review of the, uh, of the history of Europe's motorways. But what is the, uh, the 10T? Well, it's the Trans-European uh, Network Transport. And that's what 10T stands for. So the, the main routes are uh, the Scandinavian Mediterranean route, which runs from uh, the Scandinavia down through Germany, down to Italy. Uh, the Rhine Alpine route, which runs from uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, down towards uh, Switzerland and Italy. Uh, the North Sea Mediterranean route, which runs from uh, Ireland, Britain, down as far as the Mediterranean, the purple one there. Uh, and we're part of the North Sea Mediterranean route. Then uh, running in an east-west direction, you've, kind of, you've got the Atlantic route, the yellow one from Spain into Germany. You've got the green one, which is the Mediterranean route, again from Spain to France uh, and in, over towards Italy and Eastern Europe. And then you've got the red one, the North Sea Baltic route, an important east-west link there. You've also got some of the, uh, the Eastern European tentees, the purple one, which is the, the Baltic Adriatic tentee, and you've got the, the brown one, which is the Orient Tenti, and the, the light blue marine, which is the Rhine to Danube Tenti. So uh, these, these are very important links. To, just to give you some statistics, the Scandinavian Mediterranean route uh, reaches tw uh, is within reach of 27% of the Europe's population and accounts for about 30% of economic activity within Europe. The Rhine Alpine route reaches about 13% of the European population but it, it, it accounts for about 19% of European economic activity uh, within its reaches, uh, probably reflecting the fact that it goes through the rural region and the important ports of Rotterdam, Antwerp and uh, Zeebrugger. So uh, this, this, this reflects its importance as, as a key uh, economic link within Europe. And then the North Sea Mediterranean route, um, I don't have the exact statistics on that, but it will probably be maybe 15% of the population and uh, account for maybe something like maybe 17 or 18% of economic activity within Europe. So that's the importance of the 10T in terms of social and economic uh, importance within the, the, the European Union. There's a more detailed map. You can see some of the routes there in more detail and give you a, a flavour of the, 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 the key 10 T's within the European network. And uh, just uh, thinking 
important teams are here in terms of the post-war development of the European network from 1950 to 1990. Well, Western Europe and, and also the US uh, and the other English-speaking world realised the benefits of integrated road networks in the 1950s and made, made strong efforts to, to, to design and build uh, integrated uh, motorway and autobahn networks see, given the, the social safety and also the economic benefit arising from these. The second key team is the, kind of this, the, the link with kind of social attitudes by the 1960s, there was a huge demand for personal vehicle ownership and demand for mobility for tourism and recreational purposes. But there was also actually another interesting social attitude was the protest movement against roads, which emerged in the 1970s. Uh, but also, there's another uh, sub-team, uh, and that's the, the influence of external events, external political and economic events, and how they influenced um, the, the developments of roads, and I'll give you some examples of those. And then the third team, again, is knowledge sharing within the U Europe and the US in relation to design and build standards. Uh, there was joint projects, there was a lot of international cooperation, and knowledge sharing in relation to how roads were designed and built. Uh, and it's important to remind ourselves, uh, as we talk here about the, the post-war development of Europe's motorways, uh, was that all this took place in a Europe which was very different from today. Uh, Europe, as we know from the 1945 to from 1950, was a divided continent, and it meant that there was a the, uh, there was a physical barrier, the Iron Curtain, for the in terms of the development of an integrated road system within Europe. And uh, this, this, this obviously was, was highlighted by the, the Berlin uh, blockade when um, all the routes to West, Germ West Berlin were cut off. And it highlighted it in a very unusual way of how we're dependent we are on roads. And given the, the, the blockade of the routes, all supplies into West Berlin had to be flown in. And uh, so it, it was a, a, very, a very exceptional event, but it highlighted just how important roads are for, for the, in terms of the social and economic uh, 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 well-being of countries and areas uh, and, and it's a, just an important point to note. So I, I, I've kind of, from reviewing the, the, inform the, 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 the information from the time, I think actually that, 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 that the Berlin blockade must have had a powerful effect on the minds of European planners and uh, it probably affected their thinking uh, from 1950 onwards and they, they proposed the European road network in 1950 linking East and the West, the Socialist East and the, 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 the Democratic West because I, I suppose they, they probably didn't want to see such an event occurring again like the Berlin blockade and they were thinking in terms of a integrated road network which would, which would serve the needs of all of Europe and avoid the, the, that type of uh, uh, event happening again. Although it's interesting to note, they did focus a lot of the key routes within, solely within Western Europe. Uh, the A3, it ran from Spain up through France into Holland, and then the A4 ran from Spain through France into Germany. So um, the, all these, th these routes were, were located exclusively within Western Europe which probably reflected the reality in the minds of the planners that Europe was going to be divided for the foreseeable future and that any key routes should not pass through Eastern Europe given the, the probably the, the, the political realities of the time. Uh, so uh, moving on then in terms of uh, the, the, key, the key autobahn, the key 10T links, well given that Germany is located at the, the heart of Europe, it was inevitable that uh, the autobahns developed in the post-war era would become key 10T routes. Uh, the, 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 German, the West German uh, road planners were focused on north-south links which would link Scandinavia down through Germany and into France, down to Italy. So the north-south link through West Germany the A7 route was a key link in terms of integrating uh, Western Europe uh, in terms of uh, uh, road planning. So uh, the A7 ran from Denmark to West Germany and then there was the A5 branch into Switzerland. So a very important autobahn route which was developed in the 1960s. And then you had another key link which was the A3 autobahn running from the Netherlands to West Germany into Austria. And that was developed in the early and the late 60s in, in, in different sections. And then also a key issue was higher standards for the West German autobahns. There had been some autobahns developed before the war, but there were lower standards. So for the, for the needs of modern uh, uh, driving for, for heavy vehicles and, and the, 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 
the uh, I suppose the, the the driver expectations of of um, of drivers. They they adopted higher standards, and these were things like maximum gradients of four percent and minimum horizontal curves of seven hundred and fifty meters. So uh, that that was the importance of those higher standards. So then uh, moving on to the A7 the route there, you can see the A7. Excuse me. It runs from the uh, from the Denmark down right down into the heart of Germany. And the key challenge for the A7 was uh, the topography of Germany itself. It, it, it ran from the northern lowlands down into the mountainous southern region. Uh, but it was a key spine route through, through West Germany, uh, linking up all the different regions and of Europe. And then you had the A5 branch. Uh, taking it t uh, branching down towards Basel and Bern in Switzerland. Another important route was the A3, uh, running at a slight diagonal from Holland down through West Germany and down into Austria. So uh, the the key issue for for the the, the, the design of the A7 was the uh, the challenging topography as it moved down into the south. So even though uh, there was very severe uh, gradients that they had to negotiate, the maximum gradient was set at 4%. The pre-war max gradient was 6%, but they reduced that to 4% for driver comfort and vehicle operating conditions, and also to reduce noise pollution to, to avoid affecting communities like this who lived uh, down here in the Ron Mountains. Uh, so the, uh, an another important issue was interchanges. There was an interchange between the A7 and A5, and also an important interchange between the A3 and the A7. Unfortunately again the pre-war um, interchange links were, were, were substandard with 500 meter radius links between the, the two, in, between the two uh, autobahns. So this was upgraded to uh, direct links between the A3 and the A7 and actually uh, that, that interchange there today is an important link on the Scandinavian Mediterranean and the Rhine Danube uh, route. So uh, that was, the, I suppose, the benefit of upgrading those interchanges at the time. Then moving on to the A3 up near the the the, the, the River Rhine, uh, this was completed in the early 60s. It was a joint Dutch-West German project, which was indicative of the international cooperation which was taking place in relation to road planning in the post-war period. It was a very challenging road in terms of route selection. They had a choice between building on the soft marshlands of the uh, at the edge of the Rhine, and or um, cutting into the, the 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 higher ground at the top of the valley. So uh, they chose the, the higher to cut into the higher ground at the top of the Rhine Valley, which was obviously a lot of earthworks and some impact on hills, etc. But it was it, it, they they had the benefit of more stable ground conditions compared to uh, trying to build the route down near the the, the marshlands of the Rhine. Uh, it w also, they added on extra interchanges near the rural region uh, because uh, for future planning and uh, obviously all these regions eventually developed in the 60s and 70s adjacent to cities like Dusseldorf. Uh, so it was an important forward planning in terms of putting in extra interchanges for industrial uh, access. And th so this route, this A A3 route here, would have played an important part in terms for export of German pr goods and services during the 50s and 60s and 70s and I have no doubt it probably played a key role in, in Germans, West Germany's economic miracle and it shows the relationship between um, transport infrastructure and economic development. Staying on the A3, excuse me, uh, just down towards Bavaria, this was built in the late 1960s. Uh, um, again international cooperation uh, was, it, was, it was an important team here. The, the Bavarian authorities and the Austrian authorities, they, they, they designed the road uh, in coordination. And uh, uh, political approval for the road, which was running through the sensitive Alpine mountain region, was very important. So um, it was important to, to use very gentle uh, curves, which would visually integrate the road into the sensitive mountain region. So the maximum cur gradients were 1 to 2% and also they used extremely long um, horizontal curves. So this had a benefit of, a, of visually integrating the road into the, the mountain landscape. There were a number of disadvantages. The more, the more gentler s a sweep of the road meant that um, the, 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 it required a number of crossings of the Donau River, which the pre-war autobahn in the area had managed to avoid because it used much more sharper uh, geometrics. So, um, there was, so that was, a, I suppose, a, looked upon as, a, as an acceptable trade-off to attain a, a visually integrated road. And um, 
the the other problem with this road, but but which was which was, uh, I suppose, looked upon as a trade off, was uh, the 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 low curves and the the low the low gradients and the long curves led to flat spots on the autobahn, which needed extra drainage to take the water off the flat spots. But again, it was viewed as an acceptable trade off, and um, and uh, was an, was obviously an important link down into Austria at the time. Then. Um, Moving on to the A8, this was an interesting um, uh, project. It was a case of the road that never happened. It was proposed as a link between uh, Stuttgart and Karlsruhe at the, at the northern tip of the Black Forest. I don't know if anybody's ever been to this part of Germany. I, I was in Baden-Baden, and it's a, it's a fantastic uh, uh, part of the world in terms of the scenery. But um, there was an, a number of stakeholders objected to the scheme, which was going to affect the Black Forest Mountains, including the Forestry Association, the Tourist Board and the Game Hunting Association. So they hired their own engin and engineer and worked with the Karlsruhe District authorities and they, they, they objected to the scheme and, and conducted their own independent appraisal of the scheme by, by which and submitted it to the Federal Transport Authorities. It showed that the, there was no need for the scheme, that the upgrade of the existing road between Karlsruhe and Stuttgart would suffice for traffic needs. And by 1975, the, the project was shelved. So I suppose there's a, a, I certainly thought that there was an interesting lesson here for, for all of us even today. It's an instructive case that we look, we're always going to have objections to road schemes. But if you're faced with, an, with a coalition of responsible objectors, stakeholders objecting to your scheme, it probably means that there's something fundamentally maybe that you're, you don't see within the scheme or, or the, there may be a fundamental problem within the scheme if such a coalition of, of stakeholders are objecting to your scheme. But the, the scheme was shelved anyway and uh, I, I don't know where it's at now but uh, I, 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 it, it would be interesting to, to review what, what had actually happened in the end. But uh, I think they upgraded the existing road and I think it may have been left at that. It was just an interesting case of uh, stakeholder involvement and consultation before the, the route is finally decided. Uh, Belgium, like Germany, were, were focused on auto routes to link to industrial areas and, and also to ports like uh, um, uh, Antwerp. And knowledge sharing was a very important uh, element of the, the, the Belgium uh, road planning. Uh, the father of the Belgium uh, roads in the 60s and 70s was, a, was a, an engineer called Henry Hondermark. Hon and he sent delegations out to the US to see how the Americans were building roads with the concrete slip form technology. And uh, this, and there was a huge surge in accidents on the Belgian roads during the 1960s as, as car ownership started to increase rapidly. So uh, this was addressed in the 1970s. 600 kilometers of concrete slip form construction auto routes were built. And this, this addressed a lot of the safety problems by, um, by, by constructing uh, 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 um, dual carriageway roads linking up much of Belgium so it was very important in terms of enhancing safety uh, and that's just a picture of the A3 auto route which, which linked from Brussels to Liège and then uh, the other Benelux country um, uh, the Netherlands again they, they really only got to, uh, towards thinking seriously about road planning in the late 1950s they came up with the 1958 uh, Regsvegan plan and the, 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 an important project was this, the A12 running from, from Rotterdam to Utrecht down in towards the Ruhr and linked up with the A3 which I just mentioned there. And uh, that, that project was developed in the early 60s is in tandem with the A3 on, on the, in West Germany. And then by the 1960s, again, the Netherlands mass motorization and a huge spike in accidents on the roads. So much so that Queen Juliana of the Netherlands went on radio to appeal to people to slow down and to moderate their driving behaviour. Uh, so um, th this led to the formulation of the second uh, Regs Vegan Plan and uh, an important project was the A1 going from Utrecht towards Hanover in Germany and that's now part of the North Sea to Baltic 10T route. And, and I just mentioned earlier about external events influencing um, uh, 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 the, the work of roads engineers. Well, the 1973 oil crisis had, had a large impact across much of Europe. Uh, people started to rethink the whole use of motor cars, and uh, the Dutch authorities introduced a ban on driving on Sundays on the motorways, and this was meant to conserve fuel. Of course, people got around it. They, they went to their destination on a Saturday night, and they came back on a Monday morning. So, um, but. Uh, 
I suppose the, the, the Dutch, given that they have had a unique relationship with infrastructure in terms of flood dikes for hundreds of years and the dual use of these flood dikes for, for transport links as well, they, they, they took a, a, a dual use view of, of, of their, their motorways, including on a Sunday, and decided that they could be put to alternative uses such as cycling on the motorway, uh, some of them decided to roller skate on the motorway and uh, a few of them had a picnic on the motorway. So um, this, this, this love affair with roads in the Netherlands unfortunately didn't last amongst the newer stakeholders such as the environmental movement. The A27 route in the Netherlands uh, caused a serious uh, objection from environmental groups. It was affecting an estate, the, the uh, Amelis Veerd estate, and a lot of the, the trees and heritage in the estate were going to be impacted. It eventually went to a vote of Parliament in 1982 and uh, it was voted through in a very controversial vote in Parliament and eventually the, the trees and the, 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 the road was rooted through this uh, sensitive estate. But it just showed you the changing nature of uh, the changing attitudes towards roads uh, into the 70s and 80s as people became more conscious of environmental protection. And then uh, moving on to France then, uh, uh, similar to Germany, they had to plan for long range routes over a large land mass. So the Autoroute 10 from Paris to Bordeaux, which is now part of the Atlantic 10T, was an important link developed in the 60s and 70s. Section A ran from Paris to uh, Le Mans uh, initially, but uh, it was then switched from Paris to the Loire Valley for economic reasons. And then Section B, B was, to, was ran from uh, Tour to Bordeaux. They, there was two route options, one along the coast and one further inland. So they went with the coastal option because of uh, political pressure and also it, was, it had better cost-benefit uh, outcome because it reached more, um, it served more people, particularly the coastal towns of, of, of Western France. The challenges uh, with the coastal option was that it required a viaduct across the 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 uh, Zeron uh, estuary. Uh, they they didn't go with the vi the the viaduct uh, in the end. They went with with the route. They ran it down parallel to the estuary to save money. But uh, also, public opinion was sharply divided in relation to section B of the route. Everybody wanted the road beside them. So the, the coastal communities uh, um, were the beneficiaries, but the inland communities felt that they had been left behind. And interesting, I suppose, there's an interesting point here when you think about the previous slide, is that um, a lot of people are very supportive of roads amongst the general population, and they support the work of, of roads engineering staff developing roads. And I suppose it's important to keep that in mind when, when we're faced with objections to road schemes. Uh, I think a lot of the population are broadly supportive of roads and it's, it's important to keep that in mind as roads engineers. And that's just a picture of the Autoroute uh, 10 uh, there, part of the Atlantic 10T network. Moving on to the United Kingdom, the key, ch the key issues for the United Kingdom in terms of developing its motorway system are uh, new geometric standards from 1950 onwards. They were a combination of the American, Italian and German standards with, with tailored for the British uh, uh, situation. It, it was really a learning process because uh, nobody really had done this uh, engineering of motorways on this scale before. And uh, it led to debates over whether it should go with two lanes or three lanes for, for traffic volumes because I suppose traffic studies was only really an emerging discipline at the time, which came into its own with the 1955 US Highway Capacity Manual. And then the construction of drainage and pavements was also challenging. Uh, on the early motorway projects, it was really a trial and error to, to uh, and uh, different things were tried until they, they, they finally got some of the, the engineering aspects right. And public relations, again, was very important. They, they tended to use a lot of models for uh, the, the road schemes at the oral hearings, which were very good with the public because uh, they, they, they were much more easy to understand than maybe looking at a set of drawings. So public relations were, were very important in terms of development of the UK motorways, uh, but as, as they're important on, I suppose, all road schemes. Then, so the key, the key uh, motorways which were developed, which are now part of the North Sea Mediterranean Tenty, were the M6 Preston Bypass and the M40 from London to Birmingham. Interestingly, everything that was done on the M6 Preston Bypass in the late 50s, uh, it was a trial and error. 
and the lessons learned from that were applied on motorways like the M40 built in the, the 60s and 70s. So the, the M6 Preston Bypass was really a learning process. They, they proposed two lanes, uh, some engineers argued for three lanes, but they built two lanes and within seven or eight years they had to upgrade the three lanes. They went with sh soft shoulders copying, copying the, the pre-war German autobahns. The problem was lorries sunk within the grass shoulders and also water penetrated from the soft shoulders down into the to the subgrade and sub uh, the, the, to the the, the the underlying pavement of the road, causing uh, deformation. Also, they, they 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 had the idea of resurface putting on the final surface two or three years after the road opened to allow for settlement. Unfortunately, there was a very bad winter in the summer in the winter of 1959, and the trucks. Um, damaged a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the, the binder course of the road, so the, the, they applied the wearing course within about two or three months of that bad winter. So on the M40, all these lessons had been learned by that stage. They went with three lanes, which provided sufficient capacity between London and Birmingham. They went with uh, an entire concrete uh, surface across from central median to the outer hard shoulder, and then um, they also grooved a lot of the concrete surface to enable um, runoff of water during uh, during rainfall uh, and, and prevented a spray on uh, off the road for, for for cars and maintained a, a kind of visual integrity of the road. Public relations was very important on the M6 Preston bypass. They built a model which they which uh, the the public um, found very easy to understand and it was a very good example of successful public relations. The M3 route from motorway from London to Southampton that was a very controversial route and it, it went by from near Winchester it went by um, Britain's second largest uh, wetland so it was very controversial and there was a lot of objections at the oral hearing and I suppose the M6 bypass Preston bypass was an example of how to do a scheme with it in cooperation with the public and the M3 was, was probably a, 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 um, a, an example of, of 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 a, of a, of a, a consultation process which, which probably left a lot to be desired but I suppose it was a learning process for the engineers. Then moving on to the last country which I'm going to cover uh, which is Denmark. The E45 North South in Jutland, uh, Denmark um, this, whilst this is not a core 10T route, it is a Euro route nonetheless. Um, this was developed during the 70, early 70s, but the oil crisis again uh, delayed expenditure on roads for about five years, and they only restarted that project in 1977. And um, they, they finally completed the whole link from, from the north of Denmark down to Germany by 1990. And the, the oil crisis had a, a direct impact on the thinking of the engineers and the, and the planners. Um, the, the, it was judged that the traffic would not requirements will be lower due to the effects of the oil crisis. So they, 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 they eliminated the, uh, the wide medians for upgrading the road with extra lanes and they reduced the cross section to 26 metres assuming that there would be no upgrades of these roads in the future due to the reduced traffic levels. They also went with soft gravel shoulders and they also went with post surfacing. Nearly a complete of all the lessons which had been learned on the M6 Preston Bypass and it probably illustrates how I suppose we, we go along with a certain way of thinking for maybe 25 years and then some, some event happens which changes people's thinking and they decide to go with a, with a new approach although by the 1990s hard shoulders were back in vogue again in Denmark and it, I suppose it just shows you that things go in cycles. Then the E30 is the important link in terms of the Scandinavian Mediterranean 10T. It links east to Sweden and south down into uh, Germany. And given uh, the island geography of Denmark, there was a need for a lot of long bridges uh, at the time. Although today they're looking at this, the, the Fehmern uh, tunnel between Denmark and G Germany, which will link Copenhagen directly as the crow flies down towards Germany, instead of having to uh, take the more uh, uh, circuitous route and then they also added um, uh, um, a special uh, um, uh, de-icer to within the actual the surface course to allow for the effects of frost in, in, in some of the parts of Denmark, which was obviously for, for safety. So just to give you an idea, just some of the pictures there, it, that's the E20. It was f completed by 1985, and it was 185 kilometres of... Um, uh, uh, motorway between Sweden and Germany running through Denmark. Uh, that circular roundabout uh, interchange there 
uh, was put in because of the fact that there was a number of complex, uh, this was a complex road junction, and they put in the circular roundabout to link up all the complex arms of the junction. Um, that, that's uh, that's a, a long bridge over the E20, and the, the Verg limit is the name of the, the de-icing chemical which was added to the surface course, which uh, at particularly low spots which will be prone to frost, they added in the, the Verg limit de-icer within the surface course itself. That's just a picture of the E45 North, any uh, uh, very familiar uh, views for any highway engineer involved in construction stage. And then that's the opening of the E45 North. Uh, uh, and uh, again, it, it just shows you the level of international cooperation. That's Queen Marguerite of Denmark and the German Chancellor Walter Schiel. Schiel. And uh, again, it just shows you uh, how supportive the public are of road projects like this. Uh, generally, I think most of the public are generally uh, in favour of greater access and better links between uh, different parts of, 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 of their respective countries uh, for social and economic purposes. But I think there, we engineers have to be proactive in this area. We have to be out there uh, explaining to people in our schools and our libraries uh, our, our role as engineers. A lot of people are fascinated by engineering, but they, they actually, a lot of them don't really understand what it is that we actually do. So it's something I've been involved in for the last six years, and um, people are absolutely fascinated by our work in terms of our design and then our construction on site work. So I, I think it's important that we keep that good relationship with, it, with, 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 with everybody else in society. I think it makes it a lot easier when you're at the oral hearing stage if, if you, you, you've already been keeping your, your public informed, do, be it through talks or articles, etc. So I, I think that's important to keep that, maintain that good relationship. That's just a picture of the E45 after the opening. Uh, after all the fanfare of the opening within a day it looks as if it's been it's always been there and uh, it, it kind of enters enters the kind of the, the the consciousness of drivers as a new route to get uh, to, from point a to point b quicker i was just looking at that picture there it's interesting you'll see how the the, the that e40 section of the e45 is very well integrated within the landscape it, 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 it tends to flow within the lines of, the, of the, the landscape there. And also you notice the way that view to the, uh, we were always taught that in highway engineering, that view towards the church has been opened up there by the roof. So it's, it's an interesting visual uh, integration aspects of the E45. Uh, so, so, so I said so I just mentioned that and then with the reunification of Europe in 1990 this was the real opportunity for the 10T network to, instead of just north-south links within Western Europe they could focus on east-west links into Eastern Europe as well and I suppose that I suppose this is the, the picture of East Germans re getting ready to cross into West Berlin to do some shopping uh, this was really the final realisation of, of the plan which they'd come up with in the 1950s for an integrated European road network it, it, it was the uh, it, it was the it was the the, the, the vision I, I think of the the planners in the 50s w w was now finally being realized as 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 Europe was united and uh, the road network served to 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 accelerate that reunification of U Europe then today what are we looking at for the future for the 10t well it's it's uh, there's there's a huge amount of work which is going to have to take place on the 10t network they're looking at upgrading all aspects of the 10T, and uh, not just the roads, but also the rail, the port links as well, which are included within the 10T network. In terms of the roads, they're really looking at, m at what I, I summed it up there, multimodal green intelligent roads. So you're going to have ITS systems, you're going to have the electric chargers, stations for cars all over the European 10T network and they're going to be multimodal they're going to link with railway uh, terminals cargo railway cargo terminals they're going to link with port terminals so the big the, the big uh, important 10Ts so you've got again the pink one from Scandinavia down to Italy uh, or sorry I'll start with the Rhine Alpine excuse me the orange one from the Netherlands down to Germany down into Switzerland the, the, the key challenges they're looking at there are, are actually port parking at the end of the motorways uh, for big ports like Rotterdam and Antwerp. They're also looking at uh, multimodal rail links with the rail network at cities like Cologne, uh, Mannheim and also Basel in Switzerland. So um, uh, cargo interchange facilities where, where cargo can be collected at uh, railway stations. So that multimodal interoperability is important and they'll have to build the infrastructure to to serve um, 
a huge volume and increase in cargo in the, in the coming uh, years and decades, and then obviously ITS systems. On the Scandinavian Mediterranean route, again the pink one there from uh, Scandinavia down as far as Italy, uh, they're, they're, they're looking at things, because it's such a long uh, 10T route, they're looking at things like parking facilities for drivers, for long distance drivers, and uh, again, uh, things like green charging stations for electric cars and ITS, and also the, the Fehmarn Tunnel linking from, you'll just see there, from Co sorry, Copenhagen directly down into Germany there. So instead of having to go the circular route, they'll go directly down through the tunnel. So that's another uh, development within the Scandinavian Mediterranean TNT. And then the North Sea Mediterranean TNT, of which we're part of, there's, a, there's an over-reliance on roads within the North Sea Mediterranean TNT. Uh, and uh, I suppose Ireland is a good example. Most of our cargo is moved by roads to our ports. So they, they, they're thinking about new ways of, of, of adding on rail to the system, but obviously um, rail links to ports, but obviously roads are going to play an important element for the foreseeable future in the North Sea 10T network, the North Sea Mediterranean 10T network. So maintenance, ITS are going to be important in that regard. So I suppose uh, it's, it's great as an engineer to be working on part of that North Sea Mediterranean 10T, which is the NACE bypass. And I suppose uh, when, when you review all this information, it really does bring home how important the NACE bypass is going to be on the, the, the 10T within Ireland, linking from Dublin to Cork and from Dublin up to Belfast there. And then I suppose just in conclusion, uh, the, tent, the, the, the pioneering motorway developments from the 1950s onwards in Western Europe and then eventually into Eastern Europe laid the foundation for today's uh, 10T network. And uh, I suppose the lessons learned were uh, in relation to capacity. We've gained a much better knowledge of traffic capacity studies, also geometrics. They, they obviously use much higher geometrics in the post-war period, which, which, were, were, which, which really met the, the modern needs in terms of gradients and curves on the road network for driver comfort and safety. Uh, construction methods, it, it was a learning process in the 1950s, but there was much knowledge sharing took place within Europe and with Europe and uh, other parts of uh, America and Australia. So that was important in terms of trial and error of different construction methods and eventually uh, moving towards the optimum method. But as I mentioned there, external events kind of influenced the, the work of roads engineers, uh, particularly where traffic reductions took place due to external economic factors or um, constraints on budgets, again due to external economic factors. This influenced the, the type of actual physical engineering that we put into the roads. So it just shows that our work as engineers never takes place in a vacuum. We're always subject to economic or political um, factors which influence our, our, our work. And then the, the other lesson was obviously public engagement uh, and where it was done well on projects like the M6 Preston Bypass, it was a success. Where it wasn't done so well, maybe on the A8 in uh, West Germany through the Black Forest region, it was an example of um, how engineers really needed to uh, focus on consultation with stakeholders. Roads will always uh, lead to a certain amount of objections, but w we want the broad uh, uh, um, body of public opinion on site for road projects, hence we must design it so that we, we, we will have that public support, which is very important. Um, I, I hope I've given you a good overview of the 10T network, and um, I've, I've actually found it, this is actually really just a selection of the information which I've come across. And probably to do the, 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 the subject justice, I, I may put it together in some kind of a, a book, but it's a, it's a certainly a fascinating um, overview of what was happening in Europe at the time in terms of motorway development in the, in the, the mid to late 20th century. And uh, it, it's, uh, the, the, I hope the teams that I've mentioned there really um, explain uh, what the trends were in terms of uh, knowledge sharing, in terms of um, uh, public consultation there. These were, uh, these were key and, and the sharing of design and build standards. There were, there were key um, requirements for the successful delivery of the, 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 the motorway and autobahn routes which, which formed the, the foundation of the 10T network. So uh, thank you for your attention. Does anybody have any questions there? Oh, good man. One question if I make a comment. Good man, Declan. TNT. Yeah. Who is TNT? Well, it's it's the European Commission. Oh, that's yeah, very good. Well, the early years you talked about the European Commission didn't exist. 
That's right, yeah. It was the European, and uh, my, my pop. Yeah, yeah, well, that's very good, uh, Declan. Yeah, I, I, I omitted to mention, and my apologies, that, that when they formulated that road network in 1950, it was as part of the European coal and steel community uh, during the 1950s, and they were the forerunner of the EEC and the European Union community. Well, at the yeah, same time, yep. the Eagles network, mm -hmm. which ran from the Atlantic to the Urals, from the Arctic to the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. was developed by the United Nations Economic Commission. Oh, very good. In yes. Geneva, oh. And all the e routes. Now, could you turn back to the previous slide? Oh, oh, oh see, yeah. I find something interesting there. Very good. In Ireland, the route is north south. Yeah. That's illogical in European terms. Yeah. <laughs> the e routes are east west to Ireland. They bring Dublin yes. far across there. That's right. That's a political statement. It has nothing to do okay. with the need for roads. Great. Do you think it, it's it's to do with uh, the integration of the whole Ireland of uh, Ireland of Ireland? Just to give Ireland something in the package. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And the route there is in fact what you can it recommended in 1966. All oh, right. Very good. Good. I didn't know that. But yeah. Another point, if I may. Mm -hmm, yeah. Thanks, the Declan. Motorway network in Europe was designed by NATO. Okay. It's military. That's correct. That it's fundamental, including Spain, which was never. In Europe, yeah, but as in fact, it was a NATO member. Half the budget was from NATO. No, Spain wasn't in NATO. They had a separate military agreement with the United States. It only came into NATO after Franco. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because I, I actually have a book at home about NATO. And the European yeah. standard, yeah, for say roads and bridges of eight thousand kilograms. Yes. Is the Standard access load of the NATO tank. That's right. <laughs> so everything is designed mm -hmm. so that the military can move their tanks and facilities when they need it fast. Very good, that's yeah. Always, that's not mentioned in the public relations. No, but no. That is the, the reality. The same as with the United States Highway Network, mm. which is designed its official package, the defense system. Yeah, great. Oh, yeah, yeah, the defence network, and that, that, yeah, that, that's very good, um, Declan. Yeah, I was aware of that. Uh, it was particularly at the end of the Second World War. The the Americans uh, realised the value, as as you said, Declan, there very helpfully. They realised the value of of, uh, the, and as you said, their primary thinking wasn't actually economic. It was defence. It was to able to. Uh, the the Americans were even thinking of in terms of uh, an atomic attack on their no, cities. Yeah. Between so, the two theaters. But the other point you mm -hmm. made, if I may, yeah. concrete roads, yeah. that was an American pressure in the US through political lobbying. Oh, yes. 50% of highways are concrete. Yes. Center, yeah. Thankfully, in Europe, with one or two aberrations, mm. we've built very few concrete roads. Yeah, okay. And in Ireland, we've done none. Yeah, I think, yeah, the only. Yeah, that's right. And I think the only ones which may have been influenced at the time were the concrete roads on the, the Nace Dublin Road, uh, which would have been built in the 50s and 60s. Probably, that was probably the influence of the Americans feeding in there. No, that was still the concrete lobby. Business, yeah. Because concrete was made in, cement was made in Ireland, and was been influenced. Okay, right. So that was the concrete lobby. Very good. Okay, so so like the Americans, we had a, we had our own concrete lobby as well. Yeah. So yeah, very uh, yeah. I, I, thanks, Declan, for those comments. Um, uh, uh, as you say, the the kind of the military defence aspect, particularly in the context of the Cold War, in terms of America's having access between its east and west coast, and also, funnily enough, they they were worried about the effects of. Um, an attack on their cities if there was going to be an atomic war. They wanted highway routes to, to disperse the population out of the cities as quickly as possible. But no, they're, they're very helpful uh, comments, the Declan. Point is two points in Europe. Yeah. One third of all internal freight in Europe is by river and canal. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was aware of that, and uh, they're looking at upgrading the. Uh, I, and this is a slight uh, 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 variation on the road team, but I was reading through the plans, the ten T plans for the different routes, and obviously uh, inland waterways are a very important element of the whole plan. I think they're they're looking at some liquid natural gas 
uh, must be powering for boats or powered boats or something or, or transport networks for as part of the, the, the plan for the inland waterways. But uh, you say it's about one third, is it, Declan? I, 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 on the continent, even yeah. Sure, right, yeah, on the continent, yeah. And you mentioned a name there, uh, it was a name you mentioned there within the context of, was it, oh, you said in 1966, the, 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 the link for Ireland, somebody proposed so that. that. It, it, the, there was a, a report asked for by the government yeah. by Colin Buchanan. Oh, Buchanan, that was the name and you mentioned. The report on regional development in 1966, yeah. which recommended in Karelia a motorway from Belfast west to Dublin down to Cork and Limerick. Okay, right, okay, yeah. And the government didn't accept the report at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, okay, yeah, yeah, very good, okay. So that's, that's... The plan was always kept in the back then. Okay, but as you say, it, it was the influence of that which fed into the fact that we have a north-south NT in, in an east-west orientated uh, continent. Sure. Very good, thanks for that, Declan. Has anybody else got any more questions, gentlemen? Yeah, no problem. You're 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 welcome. It's it's a fascinating topic, and I suppose as as a roads engineer, I, I think it's important. Uh, apart from designing and building the individual projects we work on, it's very important to take that macro overview of what happened in the past and and um, and uh, think about it and and see maybe what lessons can be learned in terms of, of moving forward into the future. Yeah, very good. I've certainly enjoyed it. I, I think the only way to, to, to really uh, cover all the information which I've come across uh, is to maybe do, put together some kind of a, a, a pictorial book uh, which, which, which might help uh, get this out to a wider audience. I know people are under time pressure uh, uh, coming along to, to, to talks like this, but I, I appreciate you all coming tonight. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, this gentleman. Yes. What we learned about the radius situation, I mean, uh, as, as the roads developed, so also did the vehicles. Yeah, okay. And uh, was there any pattern to the uh, radius? Yeah, the, the, I suppose the pattern was, uh, particularly because Germany and Italy had developed most of the autobahns before the Second World War, was that a lot of the, uh, the very tight curves which they use, like 500 metres, they were judged to be inadequate in the post-war period. And uh, I suppose that the minimum horizontal curve was looked upon at around 700 or 800 uh, 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 metre radius to, to meet the needs of, of modern drivers. So uh, th I suppose that was one factor uh, in terms of planning for um, the, 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 the higher standard geometrics to, to, to for trucks and cars for, for, a, for a, a, a modern standard motorway, as it's referred to in the literature. Um, I, 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 I haven't come across much more. Now, whether there was some cases where the, 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 the curves were judged to be so inadequate that they, they avoided the, the cloverleaf motorway-to-motorway uh, 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 motorway, um, uh, link, and they went just directly for a direct uh, uh, direct. Uh, uh, links uh, um, with the, the, the more diamond shaped links between um, autobahns like the A7 and A3 they, they, they went for the, the, the di diamond shaped links which, which uh, drivers could maintain a, a speed of 70 miles an hour for, for the links. Apart from that I haven't come across uh, um, apart from the change between the pre-Second World War to the post-war period and, and the, 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 the more stringent standards in terms of um, curves and gradients as well with a maximum set at four percent i haven't come across much more than that certainly um was there some particular area you were thinking about in that regard thank you no grant thanks I, uh, yeah, this is, uh, yeah. If you look at a thanks Declan. Europe, yes in the 50s, yeah in fact the, they're very flat and there were no overbridges right and the reason is they're emergency landing that's right, yeah. The airport for taking out. Very good. And and was it, Declan, so any any roads, any minor roads crossing them were generally put in under the motor? Everything was under. Very the good. And that was it. And Switzerland. Switzerland, that's right. I actually, I, I, admit, I, I was going to include it, but I didn't. But there is a picture from the 1960s of um, jets. It was during a military training exercise, probably a NATO exercise. 
uh, or in cooperation with NATO, it was a picture of the jets landing on the motor, refueling on the motorway. So anyway, uh, it wasn't just the Dutch who, who found uh, alternative uses for the motorway. <laughs> Very good. Thank, thanks for that, Declan. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, look, uh, maybe we leave it at that. Uh, thanks for your time and attention. I, I hope you've enjoyed the talk. I'm giving another talk here on the 9th as part of the local government division, which will be focusing on future trends in engineering. As uh, some of you may know, I, I do a lot of research into uh, uh, um, engineering developments in different parts of the world. So I'm, I'm going to try and do a broad overview again, a macro overview of what's happening in the different branches of engineering and wh what we might see. Uh, 9th of November, yeah. So, and what we might see in the next coming years in terms of urban development, renewable energy, and also the whole electronic ICT sector. So, uh, I'm, uh, it's, um, I may be biting off more than I can chew, but I'll, I'll give it a try anyway. So, look, thanks for your time and attention, and thank you for coming along tonight. Thank you.